Good day, Grade 12s. Welcome to this afternoon, Friday afternoon lesson on physical science brought to you by turnable.org. Guys, I'd really like you to join me in the Grade 12 science class. If you're just joining us today, please sign up for the Grade 12 science class because it means that not only will you have access to all the material on the Turnable website, but you'll also be able to message me. You'll be able to send me messages and we can talk about or you guys can make requests of work that you want to be covered or you could even um, make suggestions or whatever. Okay, the, the whole point about these lessons is that they are useful to you. So at the moment, I'm going through the Eastern Cape June Common paper and I'm going through the second paper, the chemistry paper. I just started that yesterday. Um, and basically what we're trying to do is make sure that you guys understand the everything at the moment we're just doing revision and after that we'll start targeting certain sections so let's continue with where we left off yesterday we were going through organic chemistry we're doing question two and we got as far as doing question 2.5 now the question reads i just need to find my pen i don't know why it disappeared there we go question reads compound a is prepared from the reaction between an alcohol and a carboxylic acid in the presence of an inorganic acid. First, it says write down the IUPAC name of the carboxylic acid used. So we've got ethyl propanoate, okay? So it's ethyl, ethyl propanoate, right? So the ethyl comes from the alcohol and the propanoate comes from the carboxylic acid, right? So the name of the carboxylic acid was used is going to be propanoic acid, propanoic acid. And now they want the structural formula for compound A. Okay, so you need to know that this obviously is an ester. Okay, and what we're joining is, like I said, the alcohol and the carboxylic acid. So, eth, the prefix eth or eth means that we've got two carbons. So, we've got C dash C. Then we've got, okay, let me show you, let me show you the whole structure for me of how we get it. And then you can see how we join it up. Okay, so first of all, we start with the alcohol. So, we've got ethanol, which is C dash C dash O dash H. H, 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 plus propanoic acid. Prop is three, so it's one, two, three. Hydrogen, 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 double bonded O, O, H. Okay, there is that coup that we use to look for when we've got carboxylic acids okay so now what happens is the hydroxyl group from here disappears or doesn't disappear it breaks off and the hydrogen breaks off from here to form water so you end up with water so i'm not just writing out the structural formula of compound a i'm writing out the whole formula so you guys can see what happens so what are we left with on this side we're left with a c dash c dash o okay right so this dude here, this hydrogen has gone away, it's broken off. And this whole water has broken off, they're gone. So therefore there's a free arm um, here. So remember that these are three dimensional things, right? So now I'm just gonna flip it. So therefore it becomes C double bonded O, C, C, and then all the hydrogens. Okay, and that is your ethyl propanoate. Right, let's move on to the next question. Now it says compound B reacts with bromine. Okay, Br2 bromine. It says write down the molecular formula, the molecular formula for the product. Okay, so let's think about this. The easiest way to do, write down the molecular formula is actually to draw out the structural formula first and then go back and write out the molecular formula. So 
the structural formula would be ethene, and let me just go through what's going on here. We've got C double bonded C, hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. Bromine has been added to it, and it's obviously an addition reaction, which means that bromine is going to break the second bond, and you're going to end up with hydrogen, hydrogen, bromine, bromine, hydrogen, hydrogen. Right, so that's actually what's happened. Okay, but what's nice about this is they didn't ask you for the structural formula, they just asked you for the molecular formula of the product. So all that you have to write is C2, H4, BR2. Okay, molecular formula is just telling you what atoms make up the molecule, that's it. Okay, now it says use a calculation to determine the percentage composition of the product. Okay, so let us think about this. Um, okay, sorry, I was just thinking about what I should have been telling you. Right, so the percentage composition of the product. So we're looking at what is the percentage makeup of the carbon, the hydrogen, and the bromine all inside this. Okay, so we're looking at percentage of carbon, the percentage of hydrogen, and the percentage of bromine. And please remember that this is always with respect to mass. The first thing we have to do is finding the molecular mass of this thing. So carbon has a molar mass of 12, so therefore we've got 2 times 12 plus hydrogen has a molar mass of four, so that's four times, I mean one, which is four times one, plus bromine, which has a molar mass of 80. Okay, there we go. So therefore we've got 24 plus four plus 160. So that becomes four and four is eight, six and two is eight, and that's 188. So the total molar mass of this, the total formula mass of this thing is 188, okay? Now, we wanna know the percentage composition of carbon, hydrogen, and bromine, which means we wanna know what percentage of this thing is made up of carbon. So it's gonna be two times our 12 divided by 188. So that would give me the fraction, but remember we want percentage, which means we're gonna times it by 100 over one. Hydrogen is gonna be four times by one over 188 times by 100 over one to get the percentage. And bromine is gonna be two times by 80 plus over 188 times by 100 over one. And now we just need our calculators. Let's get them out. And there it is. Okay, so two times 12 is 24. So we're gonna go 24 divided by 188 equals, and then we are going to, ah, times, sorry. 24 divided by 188 equals, and then we're going to times by 100 and you, what is going on with this calculator? Let's try again. We've got 24 divided by 188 equals times by 100 equals, there we go, 600 over 47, which is gonna give you 12.77%. So that is 12.77%, which means that this composition, the percentage composition, of the whole thing, carbon makes up 12.77%. Let's do the hydrogen. The hydrogen, and this time I'm going to use a fraction just to show you both ways. Four times one is just four. I'm not doing that on the calculator. All over 180, 188 times by 100 equals, and that becomes 2.1. Three. So that equals 2,13%. Now, I know you may be tempted to just add these and subtract from 100 to get your percentage. Please don't do that because there are really rounding errors in both these questions because of the fact that we rounded off. So rather just do the sum from the beginning as you've got it written down, yeah? 
So we've got 160, because 2 times 80 is 160, divided by 188 equals, times by 100 equals, and then I press it and I get 85.11. 85,11%. And I know some of you are wondering what happens if these percentages are slightly out. It's not a big deal because they do allow for rounding errors. So for if you look at the memo, you'll see that on the memo they've written 85.10 because of the fact that there may be rounding errors. Right, so let's move on to the next question. Okay, again, we're looking at organic chemistry, and again, I'd like to stress that organic chemistry is one of the largest parts of your paper too, so you need to study it really carefully. Okay, so you've got butane one ol goes undergoes a reaction to become one bromobutane, undergoes some reaction to become this thing here. Okay, we'll talk about it in a second. Undergoes another reaction to become butane two ol. Okay. So in the flow diagram below, butane one ol is converted to structural isomer butane two ol. Okay, and then it says what type of structural isomers are butane one ol and butane two ol? Now, first of all, let's talk about isomers. What are isomers? Isomers are compounds that have the same number of atoms. Okay, and the same type. but they are organized differently. That's not the official definition. I'm explaining it. Organized differently, okay? Isomers, def by definition, have the same molecular formula, but different structure, okay? In other words, butane one ol, if I had to write that out, okay, do you agree to be carbon, 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 because of the fact they're four carbons, because it's a bat, then it's on the first carbon there's an hydroxyl okay and then everywhere else we're going to find hydrogens okay so if I had to write out the molecular formula for this it would be C4 H 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 oh and if I drew it out this one out I would also find this molecular formula to be C4 H10 O Okay, so it's the same number of atoms, the same type, but they're organized differently. They're in different places. Now, there are different types of isomers, but this year, the type of structural isomer that they are is that they are positional isomers. In other words, the only thing that's changed is that the hydroxyl has moved from carbon one to carbon two. In other words, it's not changed to become, for example, a propanol or something like that. Okay, it has just it's still a butane or butanol, it's still butanol, it's just that the hydroxyl group has moved over by one. Now it says, for reaction one, write down the type of reaction of which this is an example. Okay. So let's think about this. We've gone from butane one ol, and I'm going to write it out here again. So we've got carbon, 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 carbon. This is an hydroxyl group. Hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. I know it's boring, but please remember to always fill in all your hydrogens, otherwise you don't get your marks. And then also, please, please, please remember that you have to show the line between the oxygen and the hydrogen. You can't just write OH. That is frowned upon. I know that this doesn't ask you to draw it. I'm just giving you this information while I'm drawing them. Now we're going to 1-bromobutane. Okay, so what are we changing to? We're changing to 1-bromobutane. So it's going carbon, 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 bromo. Hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. hydrogen. Okay, so do you agree that the only thing that's changed from this structure to that structure is that the hydroxyl has been replaced with a bromine. So we can definitely say that this is a substitution reaction. 
Another thing that points it out is that there, this is saturated. There are no double bonds here, and therefore it cannot be an addition reaction. No double bonds have been formed, so it's not an elimination reaction, so it has to be a substitution. We've replaced the hydroxyl group with a bromine. Okay, and then they ask you, the next question is, name or name or formula, they want the name or formula of the inorganic reactant that was needed. So what did we have to add? What did we add here to make this happen? And the answer is hydrogen bromide, HBr, okay? Because what's gonna happen, the HBr is gonna break up into H plus and Br minus ions. The H plus is going to join with the hydroxyl group to form water. And the Br minus is going to take the place of the hydroxyl group. And there you go. That's what happened in that reaction. Right, let's continue. Now it says for reaction two, right? Now we're talking about this one. They want to know what happened between one bromobutane and this thing. So if we look over here, we've got CnH2n. Okay, and this is where the formula actually make a big difference, okay, because what has actually happened is we've gone from an alkane to an alkene, okay, we've gone from an alkane to alkene, so we've actually eliminated something, okay, so in this case we need to have some type of inorganic the reactant and you guys need to learn this and it is concentrated concentrated potassium hydroxide koh they didn't ask you whether it was concentrated or not so you didn't actually have to write it down but you did have to write out the koh or you could have write out what is koh it is potassium hydroxide and you guys need to learn this concentrated potassium hydroxide okay and it says one reaction condition we'll think about it what are we doing we're eliminating so therefore we need lots of heat we need lots of heat okay 3.4 says write down the type of addition reaction which must happen so okay we've gone from a double bonded thing we're going to Butanol. So we're actually adding what? We are adding water. So the only thing it can possibly be is hydration because hydration is the addition of water. Now it says butan 1 ol can be converted directly to the in its organic product of C4H8 without forming one bromobutane. So we can skip a step and go through it says write down the name or formula of the substance that can be used for this direct conversion what would we be doing we'd be removing water okay think about this we're going i'm going to draw it out again we've got carbon 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 hydroxyl group hydrogen 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 Hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. And what does this become? It becomes butene. So it's carbon, 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 double bonded carbon. Hydrogen, hydrogen, one, two, three. Hydrogen, hydrogen. You guys need to be careful here. If you add more than four arms onto your carbon, you're going to get the compound incorrect. Okay, so what do you see has been removed? Do you see the whole of that's been removed, the hydroxyl, and one of these hydrogens has been removed to form a double bond here? So what did we take out? We took out water. And what is the biggest dehydrating agent that we know? The best dehydrating agent we know is sulfuric acid. So this is going to be concentrated. Let me write it here. Um, concentrated sulfuric acid, sulfuric acid, or you could write it as H2SO4. Now it says using molecular formula, write down a balanced equation for the complete combustion 
of compound C4H8. Okay, guys, please be careful. If they ask you for the structural formula, you need to draw it out. If they ask you for the condensed, macular, uh, condensed structural formula, then for example, that would be written as CH3, CH2, CH2, CHOH. Okay, that would be the condensed structural formula of this thing here, the butan one r Then if they ask you for the molecular formula, you just tell them how many carbons, hydrogen, oxygen, and are. That's it. So it'd be C4, H, I think it's 10, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, oh, that's wrong, 10, H10, and then O. Right, so that would be the molecular formula. Now they want us to write out using the molecular formula balanced equation for complete combustion. If you have complete combustion of an alkane, alkene, alkyne, you always form what? You always form carbon dioxide. So we got C4H8 plus O2 is going to give me CO2 plus H2. To o. Right, now we need to balance this, okay, because they've asked for a balanced equation. So we've got four carbons here, so we can multiply this with four, okay. Then you always leave the thing by that's by itself to last, if possible, because then you can mess the numbers a bit, okay. We've got eight hydrogens here, but this only gives you two, so we can multiply that by four. So four times two is eight. And four times one is four. So if I add them together, I end up with 12. But I've got two oxygens here. It's a diatomic molecule. So I can multiply that by six. And there we go. We've got a balanced equation. If that said it was an incomplete combustion, then what would it have been? It would have been carbon monoxide. But it's a complete combustion. So it's carbon dioxide. Right, let's move on to question four. Question five, shall I say? Sorry, question five. It says the relationship between the strength of intermolecular forces and boiling point is investigated using five organic compounds that belong to different homologous series. Okay, so you've got butane, butan 2 own butan one ol butanoic acid, and pentanoic acid. Okay, so they're all completely different homologous series, right? Do you agree? This is an alkane. This is a key. Tone. This is an alcohol, and these two are both carboxylic carboxylic acids. Okay, so they all belong to different homologous series, right? Now it says, which compound in the table is gas at room temperature? Okay, and it's pretty obvious. Sorry, this is question four. I don't know why I said it was question five at the top. It is actually question four. And the correct answer, sorry, that's question four. <sighs> sorry, guys. Okay, it says which compound in the table is a gas at room temperature? And the correct answer is butane. Why? Because this is the boiling point, and the boiling point is the temperature at which we go from liquid to gas. And this is in degrees Celsius, right? So 79.5 degrees is quite a lot warmer than room temperature. Room temperature is approximately 25 degrees Celsius, okay? So this is a lot warmer than room temperature. So this is gonna be liquid. All of these are going to be liquid at room temperature. This is a gas at room temperature. Now it says define the term homologous series, and this is theory that you guys need to learn. And what it says is that it is a group of organic compounds of the same functional group when one member differs from the rest by a CH2 group. So it's a group of organic compounds that have the same functional 
group. And what is a functional group? The functional group is what defines that type of organic compound. So with an alkane, it'll be single bonds. With a butanone or the ketone, it's a double bonded O. The alcohol is hydroxyl group. And these carboxylic acids, it's your CU, your C double bonded OH, right? So let's go back. They're the same functional group, but the only thing that they differ by is by a CH2 group. In other words, the chains can be longer or shorter. Okay, let's move on. Now it says, a type of van der Waals force exists between the molecules of compound A and also between molecules of compounds B, C, D, and E. It says, write down the name of that van der Waals forces and that all you need to know is that it's London forces, London forces. Your London forces are very temporary forces. Um, you can also call them induced dipole forces. Or you can say that they are dispersion forces. Any one of those names are correct. But the correct one we're aiming for is the London forces. And what we're saying is that just because there are hydroxyls in the alcohols and the carboxylic acids doesn't mean that they aren't London forces, okay? The London forces are still there. It's just that the hydro in the hydroxyls and the carboxylic acids, the hydrogen bonding is much stronger. So, next question says, Refer to the type and strength of intermolecular forces to explain the difference in boiling points between A and B, these two, and then between C and D. Okay, so in A, we only have London forces, okay. In B, we have dipole-dipole forces as well as London forces, okay. So A, you've got London forces, B, you've got dipole-dipole forces as well as London forces, which means the intermolecular forces in B are much stronger. So let me write this down. A, there is just London forces, okay? London forces. And these are the weakest of all the types of forces that you can have intermolecular forces. And remember, intermolecular forces are between the molecules, not within the molecule. Okay, in B, they have got dipole dipole forces as well as London forces, which means it takes more energy to break the molecules apart or to separate them and therefore there's a higher boiling point. Okay, so intermolecular forces in B are obviously stronger than A. Another thing that you could have also said if they didn't say just about the intermolecular forces, if they just said explain why B has a higher boiling point than A, you could have said, well, they both have fairly weak intermolecular forces, but butane 2 own has got that double bonded O, which means it's got more molecular mass. And the greater the mass, the stronger the intermolecular forces are. I'm not talking about hydrogen bonding. I'm talking about the very weak forces like your London forces and your dipole-dipole forces. Now let's talk about compounds C and D. Do you agree that this is a hydroxyl? That is its functional group. And this is C double bonded O, OH, okay? So yeah, both C and D, both of them have got hydrogen bonds, which are strong intermolecular forces. However, D has got stronger hydrogen bonds than C. And the reason is that D has got more sites for the hydrogen bonds. Okay, it's got more sites for the hydrogen bonds. So D, also what you could say is that D is heavier. It's got that extra oxygen. And because it's heavier, it means it's got stronger intermolecular forces and therefore it is going to be more difficult to break up. Okay, let's just erase all the writing so that we can see what we're doing. Now it says, consider compounds D and E. So these are both carboxylic acids, right? And it says, which compound has a higher vapor pressure? Right, so let's talk about what a vapor pressure is. If you have a container and it has a liquid in it, okay, 
and the liquid starts to evaporate. So it starts to evaporate. What happens is it forms water vapor just above the surface. Okay, here's the liquid and there's the surface and it forms water vapor just above it. Now, vapor pressure is the pressure that is exerted by the water vapor. Okay, so therefore, I know it seems a bit odd, but the higher the vapor pressure, the easier the substance is to evaporate and therefore the weaker the intermolecular forces, IMF. Guys, I can write IMF for intermolecular forces. You guys may not write IMF for intermolecular forces. Okay, so it says which compound has got the higher vapor pressure? So it's going to be the one with the lower boiling point, okay? Because obviously, if it's got a lower boiling point, it means it's going to be more easily evaporated. So the correct answer is D, which is your but butanoic acid. So that's D. Now it says refer to molecular structure type and strength of intermolecular forces to explain the answer in form. Oh, I've just done that, really. Okay, so D, can you see that D is both D and E, okay, have got hydrogen bonding, okay, they've both got C double bonded O, OH, as their functional groups, and because of that, they've both got hydrogen bonding. But compound E, okay, has a larger surface area than compound D. Okay, therefore the London forces are going to be stronger in E. Okay, you don't have to think about it like that. You can actually just think about the fact that butanoic acid is made up of four carbons in the main chain, whereas pentanoic acid is made up of five carbons. And the more carbons in the main chain, the stronger the intermolecular forces are, the intermolecular forces are. Okay, and these are obviously going to be London, London forces, London, London forces. Okay, and for that reason, E has got a higher boiling point. It's got strong and therefore it's going to have a lower vapor pressure. There you go. That's it. Okay, let's do the next question. So this really is question five now. We've got a certain mass of calcium carbonate chunks and they're placed in excess hydrochloric acid in a solution, a hydrochloric acid solution in an open beaker, so the beaker's open, and it's placed in the scale as shown. Okay, the equation for the reaction is calcium carbonate plus two hydrochloric acids gives you calcium chloride plus carbon dioxide plus water. The initial temperature of the reaction flask is three degrees. The data in the table was obtained. There's your table. And this is time and this is the mass of the beaker and the contents. Okay, so let's just discuss what's going on before we even read the questions because this is what I would really like you guys to do. You guys get given 10 minutes reading time, 10 to 15 minutes reading time at the beginning of every test or exam, all well, the long ones. And I pull my hair out when I see students just sitting there twiddling their thumbs and not actually doing anything during those 10 minutes. I admit you cannot write anything, but you can read. And the whole point of using those 10 minutes reading time is to read questions like this. And then what happens is that you should be able to get an idea of what is going on in the question before you actually even start it, okay? So you get an idea of what's going on in the question and you can then, when you get to the question, it's much quicker and easier to solve the question. Okay, a lot of times you might read this question and go, oof, I'm not sure. And then what happens is you start the paper anyway and the question will be mulled over in the back of your head and then suddenly by the time you get to this question, your brain will have worked it out, okay? So I would really strongly suggest you use those 10 minutes of reading time very well, okay? They're there for a reason. 
Right, so let's carry on. It says a certain mass of calcium carbonate chunks is added in excess. Now, why are they are telling us that it's excess hydrochloric acid? It means that this reaction can completely run until we've used up all the calcium carbonate chips. We are not going to run out of hydrochloric acid. The thing that we're going to run out first is our calcium carbonate chips, okay? Then it says that it's an open beaker. What does it mean? It means that the carbon dioxide that is being given off can escape, right? And then you need to look at this and you see that, oh, look, here's the time in minutes. And this is the mass of the beaker and the contents. And do you see that the mass of the beaker and the contents is actually going down? Okay, so let's answer some questions. First of all, it says, is this reaction mixture heterogeneous or homogeneous? And it's obviously heterogeneous because you've got little calcium carbonate chunks and you've got the liquid hydrochloric acid solution. And heterogeneous mixtures are those that are in two phases. Now, give a reason why the mass of the contents in the beaker decreases as the reaction proceeds. Well, as I said before, this beaker is open. So what happens is this carbon dioxide gas is given off into the atmosphere and therefore the mass of the whole container is going to decrease. The whole thing is going to decrease. Now it says, how long in minutes did the reaction take to reach completion? So we want to know when does it stop doing something? Okay, when did it stop doing something? So if you look over here, you've got 192,4, 188.8, etc., etc., all the way down. And we get to the point here at time minute five seconds where it actually hasn't changed after five minutes because yes five minutes which is 186.7 and then there here is 186.7 again so you can see that this bit here the time has actually stayed still so when did it reach completion over here at five minutes right next now it says calculate the average rate of reaction during the interval from 0 to 1 minute in grams per minute. Okay, so the rate of reaction, the rate of reaction is the change in mass over the change in time. Okay, but they want grams per minute, so we don't have to change the seconds, right? So what is the change in mass? Well, we've gone from what is our f the last mass? It's always final minus initial, okay? So it's going to be 188 minus 192,4 over 1 which is going to be minus 3,6. But we don't put the rate as minus 3.6. What we're really saying is that we are, because we're losing minus 3.6 in this case, but we've also produced it because of the carbon dioxide that's given off. So therefore the rate of the reaction is 3.6 grams per minute. That is the rate of the reaction. Okay, now it says, the rate of the reaction decreases as the reaction proceeds. Give a reason why this reaction rate decreases. Okay, there are a couple of reasons. One is, do you agree that as the rate of, as the thing is being used up, okay, we've got some calcium carbonate chunks and some hydrochloric acid, okay, so this reaction is slowly moving off to the right. So we're using up the calcium carbonate, okay, but they're not saying, they're asking about the rate. So what are the things that affect rate? Okay, you need to think about that, okay? The things that affect rate are surface area, concentration, temperature, what else? Um, catalyst, but that's not applicable yet. And the nature of the reactants, which is not applicable. Okay, so we haven't changed the temperature. Okay, we don't know anything about the temperature. So that's not applicable. So we need to look at surface area and concentration. And do you agree that this is a solid? And as the reaction is happening, we are breaking this down and changing it into these products. So therefore, the surface area of the calcium carbonate is decreasing. Okay, so we can say that. We can say the surface area of the calcium carbonate is decreasing. Also, we are using up the HCl. 
So that means the concentration of the HCl is also decreasing as the reaction progresses. Okay, and that is why we end up with slower reactions as we go. Right, apart from carbon dioxide, write down the name or formula of another substance that is not present in the container after six minutes. Okay, okay do you agree that we said that the, the reaction had run to completion over here at five minutes, right? And I've actually given you the answer to this because I said that this reaction happened, you've got a certain mass of calcium carbonate, is added to excess hydrochloric acid right, added to excess hydrochloric acid. And I said this reaction is going to continue until we finished all the calcium carbonate. We're still going to have some hydrochloric acid left, but there's going to be no calcium carbonate. So this, what is gone from the test tube after six minutes? The stuff here, the calcium carbonate. So you could either write the name calcium carbonate or you can write calcium carbonate, CaCO3, because it's gone. It's all been bubbled away by the hydrochloric acid to form calcium chloride, water, and carbon dioxide. Now it says calculate the mass of the calcium carbonate consumed after completion of the reaction. Right, so now we need to do some stoichiometry. Okay, so we know that number of moles is mass over molar mass. Okay, we need to say calculate the mass of the calcium carbonate consumed after completion of the reaction. Okay, but do you agree that we've got one mole of calcium carbonate forms one mole of carbon dioxide. So if we work out the amount of carbon dioxide, the number of moles of carbon dioxide that were used, we can, I mean that were formed, then we could work out how many moles of calcium carbonate we used up. Okay, let me write that down so I can explain it to you. Okay, we know that from this reaction, okay, from that equation, we know that one mole of CaCO3 gives us one mole of CO2, right? One mole of CO2, if there's no number in front of this, this implies that's one. So we're saying that one mole of calcium carbonate is going to give us one mole of carbon dioxide, right? Why is that important? Because remember that the reason this mass is changing is because the carbon dioxide that is given off. So if we can work out how much carbon dioxide is given off, we can work out how much calcium carbonate was changed to the carbon dioxide, okay? How much was disappeared, how much had been consumed or eaten up, okay? So we need to work out the number of moles of carbon dioxide, right? So the number of moles is mass over molar mass, Mass is the amount of carbon dioxide that's been given off. So that is going to be 192.4 minus 186.7. Okay, so the mass of CO2 given off is equal to 192,4 minus 186,7, which works out to be 5,7 grams. But remember, when we're talking science, we never do grams. What do we do? We talk moles. So we need to change that to moles. And this formula is on your formula sheet, which says the number of moles is equal to mass over molar mass. So the number of moles of carbon dioxide is going to be 5,7 over carbon dioxide, which is going to be 12 plus 32. Why is it 32? Because there are two, car two oxygens. So that's going to be 5,7 over 44. And now I need my calculator. So we go 5,7 divided by 44 equals 0,13. 0,13, okay? So that's 0,13 moles. Right, 0,13 moles. And I've officially run out of time. Okay, so we're going to continue with question 5.7. 
in the next lesson, which will be on Monday. So please join me if you would like to. It would be very good practice if you could continue this question. Okay, think about what we've said so far and what you need to do, and then work out what the mass of the calcium carbonate was that was consumed. By the way, this question paper has been uploaded onto week 20 of the Grade 12 Physical Sciences. So if you go into the platform, not through the app, but on the actual website, and you go in and you find week 20, you'll be able to download this exam paper. Right, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Cheers.